Morning. Um, so <coughs> today we're going to start with Steven Pinker. And we are going to, with this, get into sort of much more uh, contemporary uh, theories of the origin of language. And uh, basically, we're going to be going through Steven Pinker's uh, analyses in the beginning, and then uh, we're going to move on to Terence Deacon. And I'm really setting them up in opposition to each other uh, as two alternative accounts of the origin of language. Uh, with Pinker, uh, we have a, uh, a cognitive scientist, psychologist, linguist uh, who uh, has been working on this topic for really maybe a couple decades. Uh, his book that you've read for today, uh, the first three chapters in any case, The Language Instinct was published in 1994. Uh, and it continues to be uh, an important book in, uh, in shaping this, this, this question of the, the, the origin of language. The main thesis that he has is in the title is that language is an instinct, which is to say it's a very specialized skill that's different from general intelligence in the mind of the human, and that it's actually, in a sense, located in a particular language module in the brain. The main reasons that he has for this thesis that he lays out right in the beginning are that language is not a cultural invention, but rather a biologically determined piece of the brain. So it's, it's not something that's, that's taught and passed down, but rather comes out of the brain itself. And an indication of this is, is, is the way in which language develops spontaneously out of the child's brain without special effort or, or instruction. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of the book consists of evidence that indicates this way in which language develops spontaneously in children. He also indicates that language is qualitatively, same, qualitatively the same in every individual, which is to say that every individual human who learns language, whatever the language is, whether English or French or uh, Chinese or, or uh, uh, Hungarian, that all of those languages, in fact, have the same basic underlying structure. And he's going to, and, and one of the things that we'll be doing next time in, in, in particular is looking through and figuring out this basic structure that all languages have. And then finally, you know, he's, he's indicating that language is different from thought in general, right? That, that there's a particular structure to language that distinguishes it from the structure of a kind of mental thought that can do without language, right? So th this is the, the basic structure of the argument all culminating in this idea that language is an instinct that's a, that's a separate um, skill Kind of like, I mean, later on he compares the language instinct to the trunk of an elephant, right? Which is like a very specialized type of tool, in a sense, or sort of uh, appendage uh, of uh, a particular creature uh, that has a specific function. So, one of the basic ways, or sort of the, one of the, um, uh, the key elements of his argument has to do with the idea of a mental grammar, a kind of a universal grammar, that underlies all specific languages. And uh, this is an idea that comes from Noam Chomsky. Uh, and Noam Chomsky developed this idea, or the, I guess the structure, the, he, he, he uh, identified this common structure that all languages have. Uh, in which you can basically reduce any language to a kind of universal grammar uh, by which all language can, can be explained as having the same uh, basic properties. And what it indicates is that language is not just something that's 
has a universal structure across human languages, but also that that universal structure is something specific to human languages, which is to say that if you had a, a kind of Martian language, that that Martian language would actually have a different structure, a different uh, kind of universal grammar, right? Because if, if, if language is a specific skill, a specific kind of module, then it actually is following sort of a, the, the kind of idiosyncratic um, structures of this universal grammar that was developed specifically in humans, right? Uh, so, the, so the claim here then uh, that he lays out um, from Chomsky is that, as he knows here, the brain must contain a recipe or program that can build an unlimited set of sentences out of a finite list of words. That program may be called a mental grammar, right? Uh, the reasoning is here that a language cannot be a repertoire of responses, which is to say, understanding a phrase or constructing a phrase doesn't depend on having heard that phrase before. It's not something that's, that's passed down from a cultural tradition, but is really a, an outgrowth or a, a, an expression of a kind of uh, biological uh, structure, right? Uh, and, the, and the main evidence here is that virtually every sentence that a person utters or understands as a brand new combination of words appearing for the first time in the history of the universe. And, and, and this is something that's, that's evidence in the sense that, that you can show that, that anything that virtually any, well, any text that you, that you read that, that's developed, it really is, if it's, if it's developed independently of looking at somebody else's text, right, if you're not actually copying the text, that it will be a different text, that, that there's that there are so many different possibilities in language. There's so many different, every time you, you lay down a word, there's so many other possibilities for the next word that, uh, that you could uh, put down as the next word in the sequence, that there, there just is not repetition in language. Every, every language sentence has to be a new construction that's based on a, a common set of rules and is not just based on imitating other examples of language, all right? So the mental grammar then becomes the way to explain how language can produce continually new things, but yet stay within the same constant structure, right? So the, the explanation for, for, the, for the variety within that um, universal um, uniformity of structure is the mental grammar, right? Um, so this, this mental grammar, which, which is also called a universal grammar, is innate to children. The claim is that, that, that this kind of grammar is something that, the ch that children are born with and therefore doesn't have to be learned. And so when children are learning a language, they're not actually imitating their parents, but they have this, this language structure in their minds from birth, and that uh, the parents are really only giving them these, these sort of cues, these sort of indications that, that then tell the children exactly the way they should express that universal grammar, right? Uh, and so the idea is that the children develop the universal grammar without having to be taught, and that they use this universal grammar to both understand new phrases, but also to then construct the new phrases that they speak. Uh, and you know, one of the, you know the one of the, one of the key types of evidence that that uh, that Pinker and, and, and Chomsky use for this idea is that is that children, even though they don't hear all of the sort of correct and incorrect, fr or they they don't hear all of the correct phrases that they're supposed to be saying, they can produce correct phrases even if they're new phrases that they've never heard before, right? So that there must be some kind of automatic way in which they're developing the kind of the correctness of those phrases um, independently of hearing exactly the, the phrase that they're, that they're trying to produce, right? So um, the key then is that in creating language, there's a sense in which children, are in a sense, know more than the adults about language, or at least as much as the adults about language, even before the adults um, give them any information. So one of, the, one of the examples then that Pinker provides right toward the beginning of this book uh, is this example of this uh, child, Simon, 
who was born deaf and in fact, you know, doesn't have that language input. He has this input. The only input he has is from his parents who have this, who can use sign language but use it very ineffectively. They don't, they're, they're not very good at doing sign language. But when Simon learns sign language, he's able to reinterpret what the parents do in such a way that his own use of sign language is much better. It's, it's grammatically correct, even though the, the type of grammar that he's hearing from or, or seeing from his parents is actually incorrect, right? Uh, so, so this is an example of how even though the child is not getting correct grammar, the child is able to construct the correct grammar out of a kind of extrapolation from the, from the indications he's getting from the incorrect grammar of the parents, right? So again, this is an example of how children develop the structures of universal grammar without actually even experiencing those structures in the input that they're receiving in learning language, right? And that they use the, this universal grammar to both understand what they're hearing but also then to produce their own, uh, their own new sentences, right? So the, you know, the key here is, is not only that the universal grammar is innate, but that the universal uh, this universal grammar is specific to humans and not part of the way in which a language has to be constructed, right? So um, you, know, you could imagine, so, so if, you, if you looked at this evidence, right, you could also conclude that, oh, well, what the children are doing, they're developing a kind of grammar um, that ends up being universal because every grammar has to have these types of structures, right? But this is different than the claim that, um, that Pinker is actually making. He's making the claim that the universal grammar is actually something that's an, an innate part of humans that's a specific module, that's a specific type of grammar amongst all these different possible universal grammars that you can have, right? So, you know, what's key is that the, the universal, when, when, when Pinker and Chomsky identify universal grammar, they see this universal grammar as something idiosyncratic to humans. It's specific to humans. Again, uh, I'll repeat, the, the, the alternative would be, um, or, or, or that if, if we had these Martians or people from some other planet, they wouldn't have that same universal grammar they would have a, a different type of universal grammar. Uh, and therefore, the, it's, it's, it, even though it's universal, it's only universally human and specifically human uh, because it was something that was kind of developed as a specific kind of uh, module in the brain, okay? So, uh, 